Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Paul F. Brandwine Lecture. It is the 12th in a series made possible through the generosity of Paul's widow Mary and the Brandwine Institute Lecture Endowment. The Brandwine Prize and Medallion, first this year, are made possible by the recently established Mary Brandwine Endowment Fund. Those of you who received the handout and take a look at what the endowment fund is about, and if you'd like to help support it, we're 85% close to our goal, and we started in November. Now we're doing the same thing that we did with the lecture series. We'll have a perpetually endowed in event convened here at NSTA annually, and you know, 12 years of endowment has kept this lecture and has enabled us to bring you Richard. Um, Mary Branwine established a tradition. She graced each, le each lecture with a beautiful floral arrangement. And along with a floral arrangement, there was this message. This is Mary's message. Flowers always make people feel better happier, and more helpful. They are the sunshine food and medicine for the soul. With Mary's passing, we continue her tradition and remember both her and Paul in spirit. A little bit about Paul Branwine. Paul was in a strategic position in the 1960s when the national concern turned to the preservation of nature and global life support systems. As a teacher, philosopher, and articulate gentleman, he quickly became the most sought after spokesman for what was then called the conservation movement. He brought to the movement his scientific prestige, his moral leadership, his experience as a leader of teachers, and a perspective of a Renaissance man. As one result of his lifelong work, Paul Branwine received NSTA's most prestigious award, the Robert Carlton Award. Paul defined science similar to what Percy Bitchman did, as doing one's damnedest with one's brain, no holds barred. It is a melee of thought in brain and mind. A Paul Brandwineism on science is, finally, we may consider science as a verb acting as a noun. It conjugates, I science, you science, we science. In short, doing science is sciencing. <laughs> science is practiced by a community of scientists and forms what he called an ecology of achievement. Any systematic assertion of science can be verified or falsified. Long before No Child Left Behind, it was Paul Brandwine who noted, in curriculum and instruction, nothing is so unequal as the equal treatment of unequals. He held that once equality of educational opportunity is safeguarded for all, the young may be trusted to fulfill their special powers in the pursuit of excellence. Thus, both difference and likeness will become precious as they should, and when they do, we shall outwit time. Paul's legacy and wisdom are perpetuated through the Brandwine Institute where educators encourage the young to do original work in environmental science. Awarding the Brandwine Prize and medallion is Keith Wheeler, president of the Brandwine Institute. Keith. Thank you uh, very much and thank you all for being in attendance today. This is a very special award for us that, that Mary Brandwine, uh, who's been the chairman of the board of the Brandwine Institute, passed away last September. But for the past year, 
um, prior to her passing, Mary worked diligently to look at how the Brandwine Institute could honor educators across America and around the world who built that love of nature and that passion for the outdoors with their students and with those that they touched. So we set about to establish a, an award, a medal if you will, in honor of Mary and Paul for their lifelong commitment. The process that we use is that we have a series of Brandwine Fellows that have been identified over the past decade by the Brandwine Institute. And they've been nominating various people from across the country. And in the end, the Brandwine Board, through a rigorous process, has made a selection for the first Brandwine Medal winner. Let me ask David E. Brown to come up here uh, on the stage while I'm just reading a few, uh, uh, a few things. And first, I'd just like to read a comment by the Brandwine Fellow, John Byrne, who nominated David. David's work as an educator reflects those values and quality that Paul and Mary prize so highly in the teaching profession. He has demonstrated through the many examples that he, as a teacher who leads students in finding their passion, their true talents through rigor, imagination, and in the classroom and in the field. One of the things that David has demonstrated throughout his career, and it spanned 19 years, is a passion for David to explore, to discover, to learn, and to share everything that he could absorb about the world around him with his peers, with his students, and bring that passion and respect for nat nature to his students. I think one of, the, um, one of the telling things, and in the process after, after one of the Brandwine Fellows nominated David, was we contacted all of the potential awardees and we asked them to write us a letter. And the closing paragraph, I think, in David's letter sums up who he is and why we selected him as the first Brandwine Medal winner. David writes, I think that I have the most perfect career a person can have. I get to inspire young people and share with my peers what I love. A wise and not so old mentor once told me, a good environmental educator constantly strives to meet the needs and challenges of our two most precious resources, our children and our environment. And I get to do that every day. David, what I'd like to do is present you with the first Paul F. Branwine medal. And on the back of the medal, before Mary passed away, she came up with this inscription that I'd like to read. The Branwine medal is awarded by the Paul F. Branwine Institute in memory of Paul and Mary Branwine to the educator who has demonstrated a long-standing commitment to inspire children to embrace the wonders of nature. David. And in addition to the medal, uh, David also receives a, um, a, a cash award for him, um, and um, uh, we also uh, thank David for that. And I know that he'll use it to take some next adventure uh, to the Arctic or Antarctic where he's fond of spending his time. <laughs> thank you. Just, just before, before I close, I'd like to also recognize that David's parents and David's wife, who is very close uh, any moment to, uh, to have a child, are in the front row here. Uh, and I'd like to thank them for making the trip in as well to, uh, to uh, continue to show the love and the support they have for David over the many years. I would just like to recognize there are two Brandwine trustees that are also here in the room. Uh, Bill Hammond, Dr. William Hammond, if you just raise your hand. He's one of the Brandwine directors. And then Marilee DeWall, who will introduce our speaker. Good morning. 
Uh, please forgive me. I'm, I, I'm suffering from conventional laryngitis. So <laughs> my voice is not what it usually is. Can you hear me all right? Okay. I had the pleasure of meeting Richard Louvre at the National Conservation Learning Summit, which was convened by the Brand Wine Institute in November 2005. At this meeting were 80 officials representing federal agencies, academia, NGOs, philanthropy, and business who came together to address the future of conservation education and the conservation workforce. Richard was keynote speaker, and he talked about the important role played by media and communications. He also spoke passionately about his book, Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder, building the case that children's experience in nature is essential for healthy child development. This was also a major tenet of Paul Brandwine's teaching and uh, writing. Inspired by Richard Liu's book and lecture, the organizers of the Conservation Learning Summit announced at a follow-up press conference the formation of a new campaign to leave no child inside. This movement has caught on in several major cities, including Cincinnati, Cleveland, Chicago, the San Francisco Bay Area, and right here in St. Louis. Richard Louvre has written six other books in addition to Last Child in the Woods. He was a columnist for the San Diego Union Tribune from 1984 to 2006, and he continues to write and serve on the advisory board for Parents Magazine. He is a visiting scholar at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University, an advisor to a Ford Foundation Award Program and the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child. He's also chairman of the Children and Nature Network, a nonprofit organization dedicated to reconnecting children and nature. Richard speaks throughout the country about family, nature, and community, and we're very fortunate to have him here today with us as the Brandwine Lecture. Richard Louvre. <laughs> 